Questions? We only have one mic, so you're going to have to use your outside <laughs> voices. That's good. First of all, bravo, Andy. I'm totally motivated to not force for you. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, look, I, I represent 750,000 people in a district that's very divided and lots of different perspectives. And I try to think about, you know, how can I, first of all, listen to start with. So we are trying to redefine what it means to be a public servant and represent in my district. I promise to hold at least one town hall every month. We've now done 11 town halls in eight months. Um, and engaging in the last one, I was just telling some folks in a town that I lost by you know, probably 20 plus points during the campaign. Um, but we had 350 people show up two weeks ago during the summer evening. Um, and it was an extraordinary conversation. So first and foremost, it's about listening. It's about making sure that we're trying to engage in that front. Otherwise, uh, in addition to that, it's about trying to understand, you know, what are some of the things that are the nuts and bolts of the district. Our largest employer in my district, a joint military base, McGuire Dix Lakehurst, Fort Dix, McGuire, uh, McGuire Air Force Base. Um, our largest employer in the district, it's our, sec it's our second largest employer in the entire state of New Jersey after the government of New Jersey. So um, critically important issue. Tens of thousands of jobs working there. That helps, you know, that's a big reason why I was on armed services. People in my district understand that. National security is very much a local issue in my district because people have gone uh, to fight on behalf of our nation. They've deployed out from there. We also have the largest veteran population of any district in New Jersey uh, because of the joint base and also the amazing seaside shore <laughs> <the> towns that we have. But look, um, what I'll say is that in my town halls, people have told me during the campaign and elsewhere that voters aren't interested in foreign policy and national security unless we're at war, unless there's some type of terrorist attack or something else. I challenge that, that assumption. What I have found is that when we get on the subject, when I raise it proactively or when someone else asks about it, we have a very intense and vibrant discussion. What I find is that a lot of people feel like they don't have the expertise or knowledge necessarily to ask the question. They get concerned or nervous to just raise it. But I'll tell you that I have had a lot of discussions about the concerns with the crisis in, with Iran earlier this summer or about what's happening with China, or what's happened. I'm sure I will be getting questions about Afghanistan uh, at my next town hall. People are concerned about this. Um, but we have to make sure that we don't make those assumptions that these are not things that people care about. Um, and we ought to do what we do, go out. But we also have to understand how we communicate these issues going forward. I had General Nakasone at the, uh, in front of the Armed Services Committee, the head of CyberCom. And uh, we were talking through a lot of these issues, and I respect him tremendously and his amazing expertise. But our conversation was one that no other human being could really understand outside of that committee hearing room. And I told him, and my question to him was not about big policies, it was about saying, how do we talk about this in a way that people in my district can care about? I'll tell you, they care about cybersecurity, they do. Uh, and they worry about this deeply, but they don't know how to even start to comprehend what's going on. So as a result, the, the closest thing that speaks to you know, this on a public level is like a Die Hard movie or something like that, right? Like we have to make sure we engage. And what I told him is how do we speak human about these issues? How do we make this something that people understand on a daily level and how it impacts them, which is something that cybersecurity absolutely does. So, um, they, my district certainly cares about health care. They're worried about the possible recession and, and a lot of these other issues. But I, I challenge all of us in this room to make sure that we continue to work together on how we're able to make sure that we have that type of engagement, that we have people that can uh, be experts do, go out and do these types of town halls and other things around the country and be able to engage them much in the same way that we will engage 
populations in other countries about issues of foreign policy. I often think when I was at the State Department, sometimes we did a better job of communicating to the Iraqi people or the Afghan people about what it is that we were doing in their countries or their regions uh, as opposed to the American people as well. So those are some of the things that are on my mind. First of all, um, I really do think it's critically important to have mentors. Um, so for all of you who have been mentoring people or in the position to do so, it is really important. It's how a kid like me from, from Jersey who didn't know a single person here in this town when I showed up was able to find ways to be able to move forward and navigate you know, a, a career path in public service that doesn't really have a manual. It doesn't really have necessarily beaten paths to be able to do it. So that's one side of it. It is incumbent upon me and others as we're going through that career path though as well to be able to really understand what specifically you wanna do and where you can think you can have that impact. When people come to me and they're like, well, I'm interested in working at the State Department. I'm like, well, like, what issues, what bureaus, what offices? Because as many of you know, you can have very different experiences across the State Department if you are in a functional bureau, if you're in a regional bureau, if you're a foreign service officer or not. You know, and I, I really think it's important for people to understand the specificity of what they're trying to get towards and be able to navigate that. A third aspect of it, though, is don't self-select yourself out of things. You know, don't think that you know, maybe that's just not something that I can do or I'm not able to do something. I mean, the fact that the fellows here were put in for this fellowship you know, already shows that you're taking that initiative. But I, I find that to be something I've seen uh, really incredible people that I worked alongside just say, you know, just kind of not go forward on some of these chances that I think they came to regret later because they just didn't think it was uh, a ripe opportunity. Um, leave it to someone else to determine whether or not you're the best candidate or, or qualified and, and really take the, be willing to take those types of chances. And I know, like, look, I mean, as I told you, I'm not a politician. And, and a lot of folks are saying, well, you really want to get into that type of work? You know, do you really want to do that? <laughs> And, um, you know, look, uh, you know, the fundraising and the, the, just the attack ads and all that stuff, it, it's absolutely horrible. It's exactly as bad as, as you've heard. <laughs> <laughs> but what I try to maintain is that you, can, that you can be a good person that still has sharp elbows. <laughs> you know, that like, like, I think oftentimes I find people who are, the most knowledgeable on an issue are after, oftentimes the people that are most humble about giving the solid advice because they understand how complex it is, right? The people that, that care deeply about public service, sometimes these are people that don't want to do the type of work like politics because it feels like sometimes we have to compromise our, our beliefs or, or it, it just it engages where 20, 30, 40, 50% of your time has to be doing something that you know, might not be the, the top thing that you want to do. But um, it, again, I, that's why I, I, in my remarks, try to say, try to measure it based on impact as well. You know, what do you think it, are the places where you can have the maximum impact? That's what brought me out to Afghanistan to work alongside General Petraeus and General Allen to go over to the White House National Security Council uh, to help uh, support the, the fight against ISIS. Those were places where I thought I could be of most impact. Um, but to be able to know that to start with, again, I needed to know the people, I needed to know the institutions, and be able to have a very thoughtful and strategic approach to where I thought uh, my talents and uh, my experience would be best served. So those are some of the things that I, I hope people think about very tangibly um, and, and really think about where the rubber hits the road. One more. Um, that's a great question, and uh, I'm going to be, I'll, I'll kind of respond to it in like a bigger picture because I, I think this really hits at what it is that I think that next generation of leadership is going to really have to tackle and, and delve into. The challenge is that we deal with 
in terms of foreign policy, the vast majority of them are issues we would have had to deal with no matter who won the 2016 election. Some of the challenges, the solutions to these challenges uh, and the proposal, how we deal with them, those are ones that, you know, they are different in terms of whether or not we are pushing towards a, multi you know, giving up on a multilateral approach towards uh, American uh, uh, unilateralism, things of that nature. But let me just kind of map it out for you. We are at a time right now when we are, we feel it through so many different elements. We are moving out from a post 9-11 world, and I say that on the eve of, of, of that tragedy. We are starting to move out from that towards a greater attention to whatever you want to call it, a, a new, renewed great power competition or uh, a new sense of, of that, that, that great power struggle or things of that nature. Um, that is something that we see economically, strategically, security-wise. That is something that would have existed no matter who won 2016. We we're also at a period of just extraordinary technological growth that in my opinion isn't just incremental, it is a paradigm shift. In the same way that the advent of aircraft, especially into military, added a third dimension to our warfare, uh, cybersecurity and our AI and quantum and hypersonics and this level of technology is adding a new dimension to uh, our understanding of, cyber, uh, of security as a whole. Uh, one that condenses time and space. In cybersecurity, we are no longer protected by the two great oceans. We are as close to Russia and China as we are to Canada. It is something that changes the way we understand timing in terms of the ability to deliver weapons or deliver impact. Um, this is something that requires our fundamental attention and requires us to think about this with a whole new lens. Um, we can't just find ourselves going back to these traditional lenses of is this a new Cold War? Um, we need to think about you know, what these changes on the ground will really impact going forward. Um, so those are the things that I want to deal with in Congress. Um, I've spent a lot of my time focused in on cybersecurity and other issues because I've, I've found that we really don't have a lot of people going into that level of depth. You will talk to members in Congress and they'll say, oh yeah, absolutely, cybersecurity is important. Or AI is important. AI has become this real buzzword that like, when I delve into deeper, no one actually knows what the actual you know, impact is going to be. Like, what specifically are you talking about? So you know, we need to make sure that we have that deeper level of engagement. But unfortunately, our reputation is one that makes it seem like we don't even understand how Facebook works, right? So we need to change that. And I think a big part of changing that is by having a new generation of leadership, younger people coming in to Congress, into the executive branch, into think tanks, into public service in different ways. <laughs> that can show that, you know, that the work that we're trying to do here isn't just destined to be decades behind, but is shaped by the type of people that step up. And what I'll tell you, I've seen extraordinary numbers of people step up in so many different ways. And the message that I brought straight up until Election Day and since then is that the energy across this country that has been mobilizing, the energy that brought many of you here in this room, the energy that we see moving forward to this next campaign cycle, it can't just be about 2018 or 2020. It has to be this new baseline of civic engagement in our country now and forever. It's about making sure we don't just react and just constantly just get emotional about things. We need to have the deeper strategy on which we draw upon. I always say, let's not play peewee soccer where we all just chase the ball. We here in this room have different expertise, different things that we're good at, different positions across government and public service and NGOs and think tanks to be able to move on. Or, but we need to make sure that we're working together. One thing I'll just end on is, in my time in Congress, just in the first eight months, I've seen just how siloed that institution is. That I can't work on the issues that I've worked on before to the level that I did before. I'm very much dependent on a lot of you here in this room to keep me updated on these issues, to let me know when things uh, need our attention, to keep me posted just on a level of situational awareness. So again, I'm not just learning about things in a reactionary situation after I read some headline uh, on the newspaper. Um, I wanna work with you on building that type of infrastructure. 
um, taking that network to move forward so we can create a, that, that type of depth that we need to be able to break through the shallowness and the reactionary elements that we see so much of uh, in Congress and across government. I'm just so, um, again, proud to, to know so many people in this room, to meet so many new people in this room, especially the fellows. Know that I'm always there um, if you need any advice. In the same way that other people have helped me get to where I'm at, I'm always happy to talk to all of the fellows here about anything um, about my career or my, uh, my trajectory or, or anything else that you might uh, be uh, concerned about. Um, you're always welcome to uh, email me. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll pass along my details. But again, just thank you so much, everybody, uh, for, for welcoming me here tonight and letting me celebrate alongside you. <laughs>